Well, good evening. And uh, I guess I'm the guinea pig to start off on the Historical Society's virtual programming. Uh, so tonight, I uh, told them I would, wanted to talk a little bit about crimes in Pompano Beach and how, what the community was like at the time. So we'll be looking at uh, five different crimes, not all of them are specific, but uh, uh, from around the turn of the century, uh, 20th century, until the 1950s. So we're not gonna get into all the latest uh, crimes. They're too, too complicated. So let's start off with uh, the young Pompano community. As you know, Pompano started uh, around 1896 when the railroad came through uh, and grew quickly with a little downtown uh, by the turn of the century. And it was filled with uh, that original town was filled with hardworking residents, but the frontier community also attracted a lot of uh, people who were, well, let's just say a bit uncivilized, uh, reflecting later on uh, the settlement's initial decade into the 20th century, uh, Pompano resident at the time by the name of Annie Kinney uh, stated, and I'm quoting here, the first days of Pompano were considerably marred by a class of rough people who liked to drink and fight, thus making it very undesirable for those who were used to better things. Uh, indeed, uh, fights were common and even gunplay was not unknown. Um, in 1902, uh, too much liquor and bad feelings uh, between uh, two gentlemen, W.H. Rains and uh, Walter Hatch led to Hatch uh, firing his rifle into a party being held at uh, the local general store, uh, uh, just missing Rains. The West Palm Beach newspaper described what came next. On Monday, Rains says Walter Hatch had asked him if he had shot at him. Hatch said that he had and he proposed to kill both Reigns and his friend, whereupon it is said that Reigns pulled a gun and shot, Hatch, shot Hatch to death. Uh, I haven't been able in looking at, uh, I haven't been able to find what sort of judicial uh, consequences Reigns uh, suffered for this act, but he, we do know that he lived until 1928 and is buried in the Pompano Beach Cemetery. So uh, obviously he didn't get a life sentence or he didn't face the gallows. But this sort of was what uh, people were describing as that frontier town where it was sort of everybody for themselves. Well, let's move ahead a little bit to the 1920s and uh, something that many of you probably already know about, uh, a little bit about the Ashley Gang. Uh, this was uh, the era in Florida of the gangsters, uh, brought on in part for, for a number of reasons, one of which was prohibition, uh, which uh, gave a lot of, uh, of room for lawlessness. But John Ashley, uh, who uh, was born in uh, South Florida in somewhere between 1888 and 1895, um, he was uh, an outlaw, he was a bank robber, he was a bootlegger. Uh, occasionally when things got too tough here on the, on the shore, he uh, uh, engaged in a little piracy on the high seas uh, starting in around 1910. Uh, between 1915 and 1924, uh, the self-styled self King of the Everglades, as he was known, or the Swamp Bandit, operated from uh, uh, various hideouts in the Florida Everglades. Uh, he is accredited with, or discredited, I guess you might say, uh, he and his gang robbed nearly a million dollars 
from at least 40 banks uh, while at the same time hijacking numerous shipments of illegal whiskey uh, being smuggled into the state from the Bahamas. Uh, the, the Ashley gang was so effective uh, that rum running on the Florida coast virtually ceased while the gang was active. Uh, his two-man raid on the Bahamas West End in 1924 marked the first time in over a century that American pirates had attacked the British Crown Colony and made off with uh, a lot of hooch. Uh, at that time, in, starting in 1922, the Bank of Pompano uh, which was located on Northeast First Street and Northeast First Avenue, and is now uh, the restored uh, pretty much to the way it was back then. Uh, it opened for business in 22, and on a and as you it opened for business as usual, and on a blustery September day in 1924, cashier C H Cates and teller T H Myers had an uneventful day as usual until just before closing time. They had no way of knowing that earlier in the day in West Palm Beach, John Ashley and his gang had engaged a taxi cab. When they got to Deerfield, they tied the cab driver to a tree, took his cab and told him they were on their way to Pompano to rob a bank. Well, there was only one bank in town, so we knew where they were heading. Uh, they told Powell to take a good look at them so he could tell the Palm Beach County Sheriff, Bob Baker, who they were and dared, them, dared him to come get them. No other customers were in the bank when Cates and Myers looked up into the muzzles of pistols held by the gang members. And in the doorway stood John Ashley himself, holding a rifle and telling the two men to turn around, face the wall, and raise their hands as they would not be long. The gang scooped up $5,000 in cash, $18,000 in security, dumped it in a bed sheet, tied it up and went out the door. They got into their hijacked cab, but, but not before handing Cates a rifle bullet and told him to tell Sheriff Baker he had one just like it waiting for him if he came after him. Kind of a brash uh, guy. Yeah. John Ashley leaned out of the cab as it crossed the railroad tracks at Flagler and First Street onto Dixie Highway. He held up the bed sheet with the money in it, waved to uh, Gene Hardy, who owned a garage on the corner and who knew the Ashleys, and yelled, we got it all. Mm -hmm. A carload of Pompano residents uh, gave chase, but there is no record of them catching up to the gang. For the record, the Ashleys had, and it probably, pro from the record the Ashleys had, and it was probably fortunate they didn't, uh, I'm sorry, the, it was probably fortunate they didn't uh, meet up with them. The Ashleys went into the swamps near Clewiston where they had a shootout with deputies and several people were killed. Now, Ashleys finally would meet their fate later, but they were never arrested for the, uh, never arrested for the, uh, robbing of the Pompano Bank, nor were they arrested for most of their, <laughs> most of what they did. But they were kind of local folk heroes, especially among the poor Florida crackers, as we would say, uh, and represented a symbol of resistance to the bankers, the lawmen, the wealthy landowners who were in the midst of changing the way life was in South Florida. This was the period of the Florida land boom and people were buying and selling land, and a lot of the people who were just getting by were not uh, doing too well. Uh, uh, the, even the newspapers of the era kind of played up Ashley and uh, uh, compared him to Jesse James. Uh, on the other hand, almost every crime that was committed in South Florida was blamed on the Ashleys, whether they were uh, uh, there or not. Uh, one official called Ashley the greatest threat to the state since the Seminole Wars. Uh, but in the end, his 13-year uh, feud with the Palm Beach County Sheriff ended uh, with the death of Ashley and his three lieutenants in November 1924, uh, when the uh, sheriff laid a trap for them at the Sebastian Inlet Bridge 
and it said that uh, didn't uh, the the rumors were that the sheriff didn't give them a chance to surrender. But this says something about the, as I say, about the way that the times were changing and many people felt kind of left behind or taken advantage of by the people who were coming here with money or changing the sort of carefree lifestyle that uh, uh, had existed before. So let's move on to another crime in Pompano. This one is another one that uh, whose fame or infamy went well beyond uh, Pompano, but it started here. It ended up uh, in the US Supreme Court. And this was the murder of uh, Robert Darcy in 1933. And this really, to me, says a lot about the, uh, not so much Darcy's murder him itself, but the aftermath about the uh, racial segregation and oppression that uh, existed at that time. I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, saying too much to say that during this period, Blacks, uh, had no particular rights that a white man was uh, required to respect. Uh, even though at this time, Pompano in the 1930s was becoming a majority black town. The, the census was showing that there were more blacks living in Pompano than whites. Uh, it meant nothing. Uh, blacks were denied the vote. They lived in segregated areas, were subjected to harsh treatment from their employers and law enforcement. Uh, including beatings, threats to be, of being killed, inferior educational opportunities, and being cheated out of, often being cheated out of their rightful wages. Well, racial, racial animosities uh, came to the fore in the aftermath of Robert Darcy's brutal murder on May 13th, 1933. Uh, the 63 three 64 year old Pompano resident who was a proprietor of a fish market was walking home at night when he was attacked. He was able to crawl to the house before he died, his house before he died, which was on Dixie Highway. Well, what followed was described by many of Pompano's black residents as a reign of terror. Law enforcement officers and armed local residents swept through the town's black community and arrested 20 individuals. Homes were entered at will and occupants held at gunpoint and treated roughly. One suspect who was uh, gathered in by this uh, posse, let's say, uh, barely escaped with his life when, uh, when uh, police officers rescued him from a mob that had placed a rope around the individual's neck. The arrested were taken to Broward County Jail and rather quickly all but four were released in Pompano, though, passions ran high. Less than 48 hours after the murder, approximately 50 Pompano residents, male residents, same thing, descended on the county courthouse to confront Broward Sheriff Walter Clark. They wanted the prisoners. Sheriff uh, Clark was not in his office and his deputies were unable to convince the mob that the prisoners had been moved to the Broward, to the Dade, the Dade County Jail for safekeeping. It was only through the intervention of uh, W.O. Barry Hill, the county's tax collector and a well-respected official that the men were convinced to return to Pompano uh, before lynching occurred. The prisoners were subsequently tried uh, and on the basis of their confessions, uh, sentenced to death. The four later appealed their convictions, claiming they were, had been beaten and threatened with death if they did not confess. For almost, for almost uh, six years, the case wound its way all, all the way up to the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, they, the four uh, men from Pompano uh, defendants were represented by future Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. On February 12, 1940, the court ruled unanimously for the defense, noting the testimony 
from law enforcement officers showed that the confessions were not made freely and voluntarily, but rather con con uh, coerced. Pompano's white population viewed the prolonged court battle as justice denied. Its black residents saw the way they were treated in the aftermath of the murder and the manner in which the confessions uh, were extracted as a miscarriage of justice. And, uh, but nothing much changed in that period uh, as far as racial tensions went. But it, it does give an insight into what the one one aspect of the community, which uh, has played out over uh, many many years. Now let's turn to a different crime, uh, and it's, this isn't a single crime, but this is a criminal. Was eventually judged. Well, maybe he wasn't eventually legally judged, but everybody knew what was going on. And that, uh, but it impacted Pompano, uh, his actions uh, allowed crime and even perpetrated, and that's Walter Clark. Walter Clark uh, might deal with this as official corruption and brutality. Walter Clark uh, was Broward County Sheriff from uh, 1930 until 1950 with one short, uh, period where he was kind of laying low. Uh, he was born in Fort Lauderdale and worked as a butcher there, uh, but he was a very well-known person in the community uh, and was elected in 1930 uh, to the sheriff of Broward County. That was, and still people might argue, remains the most powerful elected official in the county, one of the few that uh, is elected countywide, and the only ones that has armed armed people working for him uh, all the time. His brother, uh, Walter Clark's brother, uh, Bob Clark, also worked with him as his deputy sheriff, and he played a major role in a lot of the day-to-day -day, uh, um, law enforcement or lack of it. Uh, Walter Clark was politically powerful throughout the county, and in fact, in the late 1930s, when Pompano was looking to build a new um, a new uh, farmers market, the one that we have out on uh, uh, off Atlantic Boulevard, just west of the of the interstate, uh, Walter Clark led the delegation up to Tallahassee to seek uh, state funding for it. Uh, and such was his uh, uh, political connections. But there was no two ways about it. Uh, he was, uh, he allowed a tremendous amount of corruption uh, during his reign uh, that spread into every city in every community in Broward County. Um, he overlooked illegal gambling uh, moonshining, even though the pro the uh, prohibition uh, ended in 1933, uh, he still allowed uh, the moonshiners to make a little tax-free uh, liquor uh, and let them go uh, if they were on the right side. He associated with gangsters. Uh, a lot of the famous gangsters that we hear about in uh, movies and television and in books, uh, Meyer Lansky's and people such as that, uh, he was friends with. Uh, he even ran a company called, while he was sheriff, ran a company called the Broward Novelty Company uh, that was a lottery and, shot and slot machine enterprise that netted hundreds of thousands of dollars in extra income for uh, Walter and Bob Clark. Uh, he was generally had a good reputation in the white community as sort of a, a guy who was always looking out for the little man, but in the black communities, he was viewed uh, as uh, a brutal oppressor. Uh, he was, if you saw in the Sun Sentinel not too long ago, 
uh, it was his brother, Bob Clark, was uh, involved in the lynching of Stacy Rubin in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, 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 his uh, sheriffs were uh, almost promiscuously gave out beatings to uh, black residents who uh, for even uh, what we would call trivial reasons today. And uh, he often, during times when there was time to uh, harvest crops or after a hurricane there needed to be cleanup, there would be a sweep through the black community and uh, people arrested and put to work uh, in the fields or in cleanup activities uh, until they had, uh, let us say, served their sentence, which was the crops were in or the cleanup was completed. Now, gambling was the big thing. That was the money maker, and that was his connection to the gangsters and, and such. Uh, but the public, black and white, supported local gambling, even if it was illegal. Uh, many bars in throughout the county and in Pompano, I know for a fact, uh, had card rooms in the back where poker games uh, for money would be played. Uh, it, and sort of an amusing incident that sort of sheds light on this. Uh, there was one constable in Pompano who uh, fairly knew on the job and overzealous and he arrested players playing poker for money at a local bar, the West Side Bar on Hammondville Road. Uh, but when the trial came at, at the Justice of the Peace in Pompano, a crowd, a crowd gathered outside protesting it and no one would testify. Guy would get, no, no charges after that or they were acquitted. Uh, Cap's place in uh, what's now Lighthouse Point, was also a place where uh, a lot of uh, gambling took place uh, under the uh, uh, eye of uh, Sheriff Clark. One of the, uh, one of the types of, uh, most people, as I say, saw gambling as sort of a no victim type of of activity, if you didn't want to play, you didn't have to. Uh, but and most of the people who were losing money, especially in some of the uh, tourist towns, were tourists anyway. So no one really cared about that. Uh, might as well get some uh, New York or uh, Canadian money uh, to stay down here. But there was one type of gambling which uh, uh, Clark was very involved in. Uh, that was also popular in, among blacks in Pompano and elsewhere, and that was Bolita. Uh, Bolita was a, a, a gambling game that had originated in Cuba. Uh, and in the basic game, it would be that there was a lot of variations to it, but there would be like a hundred small numbered balls would be placed into a bag and shaken up bets were taken on which number would be drawn uh, and then the numbers would be drawn out and there would be sort of like a, a lotto in a in a way uh, of course you can imagine that this sometimes the bolita would go on uh, the selling of the bolita numbers would go on for a week and then they might draw the numbers downtown fort lauderdale well all the people at pompano who had bought numbers, they just had to take someone's word what the number was. Well, I mean, this is like a, this is like a uh, asking for corruption. And there was, even when they did it in public, there was a lot of ways to do it that they would uh, freeze some of the balls so that when the person put their hand in, even if they were not looking, they could tell which balls they needed to, the ones that hadn't been bet on very much. Uh, so, it, it led to nearly impossible odds to win and uh, just enough winning to keep people in the game, so to speak. Uh, yeah, there's always, everybody's got a chance. 
can't play if you, you can't win if you don't play, right? Um, well, Clark's run came to an end in 1950 uh, when Senator Estes Kefauver uh, and his crime commission held hearings in Miami uh, and exposed Clark's uh, mob connections. Uh, spectators broke out in fits of laughter when Sheriff Clark said he was unaware there was any gambling going on in this county. It's like a scene from Casablanca, you know. Uh, a few days later, after the after this, uh, Senator or Governor Fuller Warren suspended the sheriff. Indictment soon came, but he was acquitted. He was too popular to convict uh, for the jury to acquit. But he died a few months later in '51 from leukemia at the age of 47. So. Walter Clark uh, sort of spelled the end of the rampant corruption. And after him, the sheriffs and other elected officials had to be a little sneakier about what they were trying to get away with. Well, one more, and this is on, might be a little bit light, more lighthearted, unless you uh, were around then and were a victim. And this is one that we call the pants burglar, P-A-N-T-S, pants burglar. Uh, this occurred in the late 40s and early 50s. And suddenly throughout South Florida, there was a series of stealthy burglaries, uh, burglar, with, uh, burglar or burglars at the time they thought, would sneak into people's houses and apartments at night. A uh, few people locked their doors back then and steal money, often out of wallets left in pants that had been draped over a chair to be worn the next day. Uh, he quickly became named, uh, nicknamed the Pants Burglar. And in one case, uh, even a police officer uh, found his pants in his front yard with his wallet gone, but his badge still pinned to the pants. It's attributed, it was said that it was attributed to him. And as you know, it's like with the Ashleys, once you get a famous uh, criminal, everybody uh, wants to pin every crime on him. But they said that there was over 400 burglaries of this sort, netting over $150,000 in cash. And uh, Remember, at that time, you could buy a house for about $5,000, so this was quite a bit of money. Well, the, the guy was really elusive. No one could figure out what was going on or where he was going to hit, but he hit a number of people in Pompano, uh, and uh, the Pompano Police Department was on alert. Uh, it wasn't a big police department, but uh, they were there and participated in stakeouts and uh, other ways to trap the pants burglar uh, in Pompano. And as he continued to escape uh, justice or being caught, the police, not only in Pompano, but elsewhere, became more and more angry at being outsmarted. And in some newspapers and uh, uh, word on the street, uh, sort of the butt of the joke that this guy was uh, uh, outsmarting all these police officers. Well, the pants burglars reign of burglary came to an end in April of 1952, right here in Pompano. Uh, Pompano officers Cecil Miller and Robert Mitchell were on a stakeout. Well, actually, it wasn't in Pompano, it was in Hillsborough Beach. Uh, we're in a stakeout in Hillsborough Beach, which the uh, Pompano police covered back then, uh, when the pants burglar stumbled upon uh, Robert Miller. A chase ensued. Miller had vowed to shoot the burglar if he had the chance. Uh, uh, Cecil Miller, yeah, he had vowed to shoot the burglar if he had a chance. He said, but I couldn't do it, he said. I tried to hit him in the legs, but I never brought the side of, up to his back. Now, Cecil Miller, which uh, some of you have been around here a while, remember the Miller family 
and Cecil and his brothers. Uh, he was a local football star and had and uh, uh, had run track. And so he ran the pants burglar down. Uh, they captured him trying to get into a life raft that he had been used to, that he used in the intracoastal to make his escape. Uh, they found out that his name was Charles Alvin Davis. Uh, he owned a nursery in Dade County. And when asked to account for his for the life raft he was uh, trying to get into, he responded, "I do a little fishing." <laughs> so, uh, but I, I think it says something. This is uh, also right before things begin to change in Pompano. Uh, say this this type of burglary would be hard to duplicate today because almost everybody locks their door and don't leave their wallets in their pants draped over a chair. Uh, so, uh, apparently, Mr. Davis, our pants burglar, uh, was timely in his uh, uh, other career of uh, breaking the law. Well, these are five, five uh, crimes or incidents of criminality that uh, occurred in Pompano over half a century. And as I say, each sort of fit in with what was going on in the community at that time. Uh, the lawlessness of the frontier, the, the uh, racial animosities of the 1920s and 30s, and even after that, uh, the corruption uh, of, a, of a sheriff who uh, had the support of the community behind him in his, uh, his corruption. And then finally, the uh, uh, the pants burglar who got into uh, crime at a time when people still thought of themselves as living in a peaceful little community where, as they say, people don't lock their doors at night. So anyway, uh, I don't know uh, at this point, uh, I'm told that uh, there's an opportunity to answer questions. I don't know technologically how we <laughs> okay, okay so everybody that's on the video conference if you have a question uh, either raise your hand and we can unmute your phone or unmute your phone yourself and feel free to ask back and uh, you know, he'll do his best to provide any clarification that, you, that you're interested in if i don't know the answer i'll make it up The Robert. Robert, Rob Brantley. I think you need to unmute your. Do you do that? Do you do that here, or does he? Do it here? There we go. How's how's that? Okay. The Reigns. Um, didn't he become the first uh, policeman in Pompano when it was uh, incorporated? In uh, 08, I think Pat has uh, his badge someplace. Well, I'd have to, I'd have to double check that. I can't. I'm, I Pat, know I've got a list. I've seen and uh, have a list of all the first uh, officials in Pompano, but I can't remember right now uh -huh. if he was. Okay. If he was one of them, I'll check that. And I know, I know your number. <laughs> I think uh, Pat has got his uh, badge. Okay. Uh, and uh, he also, I believe, was um, in the Spanish American War. Um, I, because I checked for some other, from some other things that Pat got from him. Uh, uh, it, was a, it was a medal from the Spanish American War. Well, with uh, Teddy Roosevelt. He was, uh, I'm trying to think, he would have been awful young, but I don't doubt, I don't. Yeah. I, I called uh, the place he was from. He was, he was it, it seems to work out. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll, double I'll double check on that. There was a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of rains over in the oh. uh, Pompano okay. Cemetery, so I might. 
got yeah. some mixed up, but yeah, I'll, I'll look that up. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I think if you have a question, you need to just unmute yourself or something. I'm not sure how this works. But... We're all learning. <laughs> Okay. You can either unmute yourself directly, or if you raise your hand, there's a little button at the bottom of your screen where you can raise your hand, and I can unmute your microphone for you. I think some people might be on telephone, but uh, in that case, I don't think raising your hand will do any good. I have a question, Dan. Yeah. So. How was it that the Ashley gang could have been active so long, robbed 40 banks, but not be challenged? Well, two things. One, they had a lot of hideouts in the Everglades uh, that were hard to get to. There weren't many, there weren't a whole lot of police uh, force members at that time. Uh, and going back into the Everglades where the Ashleys were was not uh, conducive to your health uh, since they were, had, had grown up in that, in that venue. So it's sort of the same thing that, it, again, as I said, a lot of the people took a very kindly view towards them, saw them as almost uh, whether they themselves profited from it or not, kind of a Robin Hood type of, uh, of character. And so getting uh, community support to, to rouse these people out was not uh, forthcoming. Although the bank presidents didn't share that. No, no, they didn't, but they, <laughs> a lot of people weren't too. So did Papano have a police officer at that time? Yes, yes. Uh, I don't know who it was at, at that particular moment, but uh, they did have a small, Constables usually. As you were talking about that, it reminded me of the movie Bonnie and Clyde. It sounds so similar. Very, very similar. Even to the uh, the actually, I don't know if everybody heard that. Said it reminded him of the of Bonnie and Clyde, and very similar. Even to the extent that uh, uh, John Ashley had a girlfriend or wife or whatever she was, that uh, uh, at times went on forays with him, uh, uh, Laura up the Grove. And that, that family was a big one in the Palm Beach uh, Everglades area. But I couldn't help noticing that, you know, when you just, what you just said, that everybody kind of liked them, um, except for the police officers and bank officers, you know, but. I remember in the movie of Bonnie and Clyde um, that everybody liked them too. You know, when they got shot, they all came out to see their bodies, their car, the whole nine yards, and it was, you know. Yeah, they, a lot of gangsters were like that. Yeah, they, were they were popular weird. with the quote, little man. Yeah. Uh, they were, you know, if you robbed the bank, the bank president was always rich while everybody else was poor, so. You mentioned that Walter Clark had a lot of political power and he also you know, supported the gambling spirit of the times during the 30s and 40s and I guess in the 50s. Were these the same gambling games that we think of in New York and Chicago? Did they have branches down here? Some were, uh, particularly in uh, the most famous were the ones in Hallandale, which were owned by the, the mob. Meyer Lansky, and I don't know all the, the names of the various gangsters, but they were branches of the New York mob, maybe Chicago too. Uh, once you got into Fort Lauderdale and Pompano, it was more smaller, as most of the people who uh, frequented the gangsters, nightclubs and gambling uh, uh, locations came up from Miami. Okay. So the farther away you got, the the more uh, 
rustic, let's say, the gambling was, and appealed more to the locals. Yeah, I, I think I had rather heard that uh, Al Capone had some interest down here in South Florida. Oh, yeah. Yeah. From Chicago. yeah, he had a mansion in Miami. And uh, of course, the question, the, the comment was, if you didn't hear it, was that Al Capone was down here, and indeed he was. Uh, and uh, he didn't die till I think 47 or something like that. So uh, during this period, uh, he probably had, did have uh, uh, his fingers in some of the, uh, the gambling pies, so to speak. Um, Do you know if, if a gangster owned a Vizcaya at, at one time? I thought I had heard that. Um, the question was, did, uh, did a gangster own Biscay at one time? I don't think so, but, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it, I think it remained in the family's hand until it became okay. a, a museum. Okay. Yeah. So maybe before that, because, yeah, it's, yeah, quite popular now. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Al Capone did have a mansion in, in Miami Beach or one of the uh, one of the islands between Miami Beach and Miami. I don't know what what city it, it, it belonged to. When did casinos actually become a thing in South Florida? Like, like we think of legalized casinos. Uh, well, legalized casinos uh, is fairly recent. It really was a situation where the Seminoles, and I forget the exact year, the Seminoles said, you know what? We don't have to obey Florida law. We're a sovereign nation, so to speak. And uh, said they were gonna do it no matter what. And then once the cat was out of the bag, uh, the, the state began to slowly get themselves into it saying, okay, well, you, you can do it if you're doing horse racing or you're doing some other paramutual, and that's uh, that. But that's only what last 20 years. That, but that's been before There's that a period in South Florida, where as in Las Vegas, where the mob owned the casinos and ran the shows. <laughs> right, but it was <laughs> it was, it was a, a period of that, wasn't there? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it, it was unlike uh, Las Vegas, where the uh, casinos could operate legally because of state law. Down here, they everybody knew about it. But no one really wanted to do anything about it until, you know, they shine the spotlight yeah. on on that, and not only the the casinos, but all the other corruption that that went along with it. Uh, gambling, though, had has goes back way back in South Florida history to the beginning. The first sheriff of Broward County was A. W. Turner who was from Pompano and uh, he was elected to be the first sheriff and he was kicked out of office by the governor, which seems to be a recurring theme among sheriffs in Broward County uh, because he was allowing gambling to go on uh, under his watch. Uh, and it was the same sort of thing that everybody said, it's, you know, who cares if it is if the tourists get taken at uh, the gambling tables? Uh, so, but Sheriff uh, Turner was kicked out. But sheriffs are are uh, uh, persistent. He ran against his uh, replacement in the next election and won, and so he was back <laughs> back in there. So he was uh, Broward County's first or Pompano's first. Countywide elected official, A.W. Turner. Anything else? Yeah, I want to. Yes, yes. Well, thank you very much.